Now, next up, ferreting. And uh, I, I, think, I think it's fair to say he's my favourite ferreter, and he's not come to talk to me about ferrets today. He's come to talk to me about his dog. It's Simon Whitehead and Tawny. Come here. Right, you, you made us a special film which we're going to run behind you. Sit down. And this is, the, this, is the, this is the life story of Tawny, isn't it? So far, yes, yeah, she's uh, five this year, so I decided for the game fair just to make a little clip of her life so far. And it's been going very well on the Pugs and Drummers stand. So, uh, yeah, we learn everything from each and different dog we get. I've done that thing of, of, of saying hello to Tawny and, and therefore immediately disobeying your every command. And, there's, well, and what can you do? You know? The beauty of our lurchers are is that they not only work hard and run hard, but they're just a great animal to be around, a great family pet. So, yeah, she works hard. She deserves all the creature comforts she gets. Good. Right. I've, I've always had you here talking about ferrets. I've had you here talking about ferrets before, but I, I want to talk about dogs because I think that's... Ferrets are a tiny bit characterless compared to dogs, aren't they? Certainly are. I mean, this one's got plenty of character. I mean, all the lurchers do. But the, um, especially Tawny, she was from a pup, and I've had her since she was six weeks old. She's how just been completely her own, her own being. Her own girl. How, how do you choose a good lurcher? I don't. It's Hobson's choice. I didn't want her, and at times I don't want her. <laughs> but you know what it's like? I, I got, her at, I got a, friend, a good friend of mine, Torchy, Ian Clayton, his dog Dan was the father and it's very good rabbit and dog on the hills in the north and it got bred to a, a three-quarter collie greyhound in Merseyside and Torchy, bless his soul, he wanted one of the pups to go to a really good working home so he played that emotional blackmail of, oh Simon I'd really like you to have a pup oh. and how, how can you turn it down once he says that? You can't, no. So um, I went up the M6 on a horrible Friday night, picked this thing up at six weeks and yeah, she's, it's, it's been an education every week of her life. And she's, you're saying she's Border Collie Greyhound? Yes, uh, the, the only um, dogs in her lineage is Border Collie and Greyhound. So Dan was a three-quarter Collie Greyhound, so three-quarter Collie, quarter Greyhound. And the, the mother was three-quarter Greyhound, quarter Collie. So it's, pff, I'm not good at maths, but no, it's but like three-eighths, five-eighths or whatever. You managed to get the black and white out anyway. Oh yeah, I, I didn't want a black and white dog, and I'm lucky that they sent this one down because black and white dogs, yeah, they're all, they were all obsessed about this, this collie look and this collie lineage. I just wanted a dog with a good nose, was adaptable, versatile, and was very fit. And unfortunately, very driven, and, and that's what she is. She's very, very driven. Is she bold? Is she bold? Will she, will she go, will she go she, in and go she, on? She is too, for me, she is too driven. Uh, she's the worst dog I've ever had around nets because... When I look at all the films and photographs we've done of her, her eyes are fixed on the rabbit. It's like a heat-seeking missile, whereas all the other dogs are always looking to the nets and the wall and the trees and, the, and everything else. This thing, it's the rabbit, and it's there. So and unfortunately, I think I've made her more driven with how I've raised her. She's like Boris Johnson with a rugby ball when she can see a seven-year-old and it's straight through and not just knock it, knock it off its feet. Doesn't matter what's in the way, it's no. going through. <laughs> There's a thing in, in lurcher breeding, isn't there, at the moment? I mean, people want big, bold dogs. They, and the, the bull lurcher, which is very popular, and, and so they're looking to breed in with Wheaton Terriers, for example. That, 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 that seems to be a, a popular it's area. A, it's a popular thing, but I, fads and fancies. Fads and fancies. You walk around the game fair, everybody's wearing Fairfax and Favourite and white jeans. It's pouring down with rain. Fact, you know, it's fads and, and, and fashions. When you look at dogs, you want a dog that does the job for you. Uh, so, so being a rabbiter, collie greyhounds. Okay, and, and, and your, your work, I mean, you, uh, you've got on, uh, on that photograph there, you're obviously up on Moorland. I mean, you, you live in Suffolk, though, don't you? I live in Suffolk, work in East Anglia, but with me experience days and me work and me media work, I'm, I'm basically rabbiting all around the country. So you, you, so you want some, a, a dog that can see a long way? You know, a gaze it's got, got nothing to do about seeing a long way. I no. don't want the dog to be hunting up or looking 300 yards that way and trying to chase a rabbit. I want her to be focused on what I'm doing. Now, at home in East Anglia, where it's hedge work, I would normally go for a slightly smaller dog. I mean, Tawny's about 25 inches, 24 and a half. Uh, my normal dog's around 21. Smaller, lighter, can turn on a sixpence, better around net. But as I said, I got, I got Tawny, and when she's up on the hills, there's nothing to beat her because she's got the stride, she's got the strike, she's got, she can turn. But because we've always given her success, 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 she now thinks... Every rabbit's hers. Oh, I see. And, th <laughs> and, and, that, and that drive is good, 
but it does put your heart in your mouth at times. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so, because they, I mean, they will quite unwittingly break a leg, won't they? Well, it's not just that. She had a very, well, she's had two bad injuries. Uh, one of them was when we did the filming uh, on the Yorkshire Dales. She chased a rabbit and took the rabbit going into a stone wall. Now, you know, stone walls don't move. And when she brought the rabbit back, there was a load of blood on the rabbit. And I just thought, it's the rabbit. And we looked in her mouth, and all we could see was here. Oh. There. Yeah, we could see a little white, like almost like a tic tac, and I actually snapped a tooth off. So we'll just crack on. Uh, we did a full day on the hill. We went went over to Teesside with Maka again on the on the film. Did another full day. This dog was bouncing, and I thought I'm going to take it to the vet because I didn't want a cracked tooth to decay and get an infection. And when I went to the vets, the vet rang me straight back up and said, "We can't do this. You've got to take it to a canine um, cat scan unit in Newmarket." Oh my uh, goodness because it's a bit more serious than what we thought. And I said, there's no chance, because that's like eight grand, you know. And, and I yeah. love my dog, but I just said, just do your operation. No matter what you charge, just do it. And I said, you've got to come down and look at the x-ray. And what had happened, when she took that rabbit in Yorkshire, she had pushed the tooth and the root in one go above her palate. Ow. So what I saw was a little white blob of a tooth above her palate. And she, since she did that, them two days, she had like 50 rabbits odd in her mouth, uh, pouncing. Yeah. The vet couldn't believe how physically fit she was, which a lot, a lot of lurchers are, they're physically fit. But they said, well, the problem is, if we take it out and it shatters, we've then got to open up the pallet to get the pieces out. And I just said, well, you've got to do it. Yeah. Uh, luckily, they got a pair of forceps, pulled it all out in one go, Wow. stitched it up, give her some antibiotics, Four days later, catching rabbits. Blimey. Vets bill? Uh, very scary, but it wasn't too bad. Uh, six, six <coughs> hundred pounds. Uh, okay, but, right, you know, okay. It was worth it because <laughs> you, you, you just do your best for your oh, dogs. Yeah, you, you, you have to. Um, Lurch is not the only choice for a, for a ferreting dog. I mean, have you had whippets? Uh, no. <laughs> Would you Next. have whippets? Uh, no. What, uh, what's what's um, the basic problem? Nothing against whippets. They're great dogs. A lot of my Sounds friends. Like there is. A lot of my friends have whippets. Uh, to me, it wouldn't last. It's not man enough. Its legs are too thin. They're too small. They tend to yap. But they're not got the brains that I want. And if you don't if you don't believe in the dog you've got, you're not going to get the best out of your dog. So uh, it, you know you may have the best whippet in the world if it no, works you know, for it's you. Two, it's two whippet owners. Two just whippet walking owners. Walking there, yeah. out. The moment you start insulting dogs, dog owners just walk away. Well, you know me, Charlie. I don't care. So <laughs> the, uh, but it's not for me. It's not for me. Okay. So what I want is a little bit of hybrid vigor, a little bit of durability, and I want something I can't break. All right. And um, and uh, alongside Tawny, is, is it is it worth having a terrier? Is there, is there, are there any other dogs you would have alongside Tawny? No, I'm I'm. I will work two lurches together, I'm not a big fan of it, and the reason being is one of them, if you work them all together, one of them is like a centre-back on a football team, you always get one that depends on the other, and when that one's missing, it's lost. And also, when you've got two dogs who are chasing rabbits at 30 miles an hour, the chances of them colliding or causing damage, or both thinking each other's going to do it, it's too much to take, and I've only seen once a couple of dogs really work well. And, and when I mean working well, I mean working well, not putting up with each other. Because on here, we've got Dasher and Tawny working together. Them two dogs work very well together because Tawny catches, Dasher takes it off and brings it back. They're not in each other's company. They just look at each other and they get on with it. And I would have loved to have bred Tawny with Dasher, but unfortunately, because they both carry the Merle gene, I can't breed them. So because they both what? They, they carry the Merle gene, the Collie Merle gene. And what, if you breed, Mer well, you've got Merle Collies, your tricolour Collies with your wall eye and your, your colour. If you breed two Merles together, you have a lot of uh, mental and physical problems with the pups. Ah. And so you've got to be very careful. Okay, I see. Right. So that, that's just a, a general rule about, about lurcher breeding. Yeah, it's just, good, it's just husbandry. But the uh, and terriers, uh, I, there's, there's a reason why when people go ferritin and want to catch rabbits, they use lurchers. Um, and I'm yet to see a good terrier because they're short-legged. They tend to be a little bit headstrong. Um, any other dog, yeah, there may be the odd exception, but when you look at the consistency of the breeds people use, and it's always rabbiting, uh, always lurches for rabbiting, maybe collie whippet greyhound or, or kelpie collie whippet greyhound or something like that. There's a lot of bedlington crosses, but they tend to 
be a little bit more They're headstrong. They're pretty, aren't they? They're the kind of very the blue pretty. Color. I mean, I've got one in the, in the car, Bella. A very pretty dog. Um, very sociable, but at the end of the day, that Bedlington Terrier's just got that little bit of mm about it. Well, come on, just define mm. You, you keep mm, using North of England a, terms. A little bit of a little bit of being a little bit headstrong. You know, like. Um, you know, if it wants to do something, and Bella's got that down to a T, if she, if she, if she just wants to do something, she'll always do it, and then give you that look, and she's going to do it. And when you, you, you're rabbiting, and they're training them, that it's there, and it's in the head, but there's always that little terrier look, you know what I mean? That yeah, like, yes. Yeah, I mean, so it's like, I've got Sean here who helps me out. He gives you that look. You know, <laughs> yes, he, he does. If you like, he does just turn them. around. You can see Sean giving you that look. Give, give us you the know, Bedlington look. You know, he's just going to do what he wants. Is he, he part he, terrier? He, yeah. Well, he looked at the size of him. He's not a great Dane, is he? <laughs> okay. So, uh, so I'm, I'm kind of building a picture here of not only what makes a perfect lurcher, but how I would choose a good lurcher. Yeah, it, it, it's the the breed and how they're brought on. Because you, what you've got to remember is, as, as a young dog, you've got the ligaments, the diaphragm, the brain. You've got to take care of. And they don't really mature till about 18 months, two years old. And they don't reach the peak till about three and a half, four years old. As they reach the peak, you're then looking for another dog because it's a, a decline. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm quite lucky. I can give them a fair bit of work. And they l normally live, apart from one of my dogs, into well into double figures. So even though she's losing pace, she can still work with the ferrets. So a lot of older dogs come out of lamping and into ferritin, where they've lost the pace or they've had a few injuries. They can take up, they can get to go to ferritin, and it's just nurturing them through. And there's a lot of training going because you've got a lot of contradictions when you want to work them. Has anybody here got a lurcher? We've got any lurchers in today? Anybody here thinking of getting a lurcher? I bet you the two Labrador owners over there bet they've got no interest in lurchers whatsoever. Well, we are talking about dogs, though. You know, there's the thing. But the, the problem is with lurchers is, is, is a lot of the times, because they get such a bad press, you know, people don't look into the, the good parts of things. You know, it's like, it's like a lot of dogs. Well, there's a sort of mythology about lurchers, isn't there? I mean, I, I, know, I know one whose owner claimed it was trained by local travellers, and he said all he had to do was lift a handkerchief in the air, and whatever it was carrying, it would immediately drop. Because yeah, that well, solves him some problems with I, I, I've, I've spoke to thousands of people like that here this weekend. You know, I've got magical <laughs> ferrets. I've got magical this, I've got magical that. But it's funny enough, you never actually see them on YouTube, do you? <laughs> okay, so if, you're, if your dog has secret magical powers, film it, put it on YouTube, and you, you'll, you'll do very well. Um, if you were going to choose a terrier uh, that, I mean, you said you would accept a terrier on, in the ferreting field, uh, what sort of qualities are you going to look for? And it's a slightly leading question because I, I, I'm going to see if there's any differences between that and Tawny, and you know if there's any kind of improvement we could make to Tawny. Yeah, well, the the, the difference is the stark physical difference: short legs, long legs. So it's like asking Sean to race Usain Bolt. <laughs> you know, he could be a lot quicker runner. The laws of physics and and your your, your size. You got your stronger, longer gait. So a terrier is going to go six to the dozen, get nowhere. A lurcher, three strides, it's there. Yes, the terrier can turn quicker, but it's a, as a rule, bar like borders and, and some specific crosses, they're a lot more vocal. Uh, and the last thing you want is a vocal dog on top of a rabbit warrant, hence why a lot of the lurchers are mute. And then you've got the obedient side of things. Now, if a terrier was that obedient and intelligent, we would be seeing them in uh, scurry competitions to win money, but we don't. We see lurchers because they have that ability to be obedient, trained, and do the job. So terriers are slightly little rascals, um, and I've only seen like one or two that I would tolerate in a, in a, alongside me ferreting because they've, they've just, well, most of them have been border terriers, by the way. They're, they're border terriers. Border terriers, And they're, yeah. they're, the, they're the only ones you, you would even well, consider? I've, I, I don't dip my toe into that sea because I just I just don't want terriers with me, you know. Because no. if you go out ferret, it's like humans. If you take people out ferret, the last person you want is a noisy one that smokes all the while and is not going to lift his hands to do any work. The same with the dogs. You've got to, you know, you've also got the relationship between the dog and the ferret. A terrier has been bred for hundreds of years to kill small furry things. We work small furry things, so you've got that stock breaking uh, problem as well. So. If you're taking somebody out and they're your ferrets, you know, unfortunately in this day and age, 
Oh, your dog's stock tr- Oh, yeah, they're fine, they're fine, they're fine. You know, and then next before you know it, it's walking around with your best ferret. So yeah. there's a now, lot of things to take into account. You've been ferreting all around the country and, and, and with other people. And you, you've probably seen more ferreting in all its different forms yeah. than most. Yeah, yeah. Ever been surprised by a breed of dog you found? Any, anyone that you didn't expect would do what it did and turn out to be better than you thought? No, no not really, because the... Um, I'm, I'm trying to give the Labrador owners some hope here, that's all. The, 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 um, I mean, Labradors do have the good points. <laughs> they do have the good points. I'm not, Shall we I'm list not, both of them? Uh, I mean, no, good Labradors, they make good oil paintings, <laughs> and they're very photogenic. Not going to catch many, but they're not bred for it. You know, and this is, this is the thing, you know, everybody in the, in the modern era, especially with social media, trying to reinvent the wheel for notoriety, ego, and their bit of fame. There's a reason why you can look at all the works of art, shooting retrievers, spaniels for flushing, terriers for earthwork, lurchers for rabbiting. It's no coincidence, since you're a dog, they have stuck in with certain breeds of dogs to do certain jobs. Now, if you want to be the exception, like a Columbus Spaniel owner or a Vizsla or a, a, a German Whitehead Pointer, and want to go out of your comfort zone and dip your toe into somebody else's, fill your boots. You are never going to compete with some breed of dog that is being bred, trained for that purpose. It's like when you have the, uh, the, the Olympics and the decathlon. They're good at nine or ten events. When we see one of them that's good at one event, and it goes up against a specialist, say, one was good at 100 metres, I'll go in the 100 metres and take these boys on, they get whooped because they're just, it's a different level. It's Sunday League, First Division, and then Premier League, then Champions League. And with the dogs, I've yet to see it. You know, I get plenty of people say it, and I, I, I tell this to everybody. If you've got the best whatever in the world and you want me to come down and have a look, come to me or whatever, do it. And they're all, yeah, 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 until it comes down to it. Until it actually, you've got to show people what it is. Okay, well, so it. believe in, in the breeding. I edited, uh, with a friend of mine, I edited a, a supplement for one of the, the machine magazines uh, about gun dogs. We called it Pup, Pup Idol. And in the end, we found we weren't really writing about the dogs at all. We were writing about the owners, you know. So if you've got a Hungarian Vizsla, you know, you're probably a bit dim and you live in, in Wimbledon. That, that, that sort of seemed to be ha- how it works. Well, I wouldn't want to stereotype the, uh, <laughs> the archetypal lurcher owner in a public place. <laughs> but as I said, you know, uh, lurchers, they're owned by lords and ladies, kings and queens, right down to a dustman and somebody who's homeless. So they are there for everybody. OK, well, you're winning the judge's prize for a dog that sits on a sofa, most like its owner. Um, <laughs> But can I ask about why, why is it that of all the kind of recognisable breeds in our world and the game fair world, the lurcher is a hybrid, isn't it? It's not actually a breed. It's, it's a type of dog. A lot of people wrongly think it's a mongrel. Well, a mongrel's pedigree unknown. A type of dog is what you know what the lineage is, but they're not from pedigree ancestry. So a lurcher is a type of dog. I say you've got collie greyhound, collie whippet greyhound, bedlam greyhound. But why, why can't we settle on, on you know, a lurcher? Like we've, we've managed to settle on a Labrador, and that, that took a quite a lot of doing. Well, it's because such a great breed of dog deserves to have many different <laughs> categories. <laughs> and it's, no, it's, it's like this with Labradors. Um, you know, are they, do you call that fox red, yellow, red? Red. Why do you call it red and not yellow? No, it's not, it's yellow. It does look a bit yellow from right... Okay. There's, there's two Labradors, isn't there? Yellow it, Labrador, black Labrador. Let him have it. Or it's a chocolate a, Labrador. It's red. But now there's a fox red Labrador because, you know, it's worth more money. Oh, no. Fashions fashions and fads yet right, again. Hang on a sec, Simon. You can't slouch on a sofa with your dog and, and, and insult a perfectly good Labrador owner and not let him reply. Would you like to reply to that? Well, no, the, the kennel clubs still say they're yellow, so... So I was they're right, I'm like what, Brian Clough. What people I'm like them. Brian Clough, you can have your say, then I tell you I was right all oh, along. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> there we are, typical lurcher owner. <laughs> okay, so um, what, what, I, what, I'm, what, what I'm trying to get to is, you know, if this dog did this one specific thing so well, surely we'd have come up with a breed standard by now. No, because they're always, I think it's the unpredictability of genetics, and I'm not into genetics, but the problem we've had with lurchers, and, 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 and this is a one that's been going back for hundreds of years, because you've got a certain amount of different genes in there, you've always got the dominant and subdominant genes. Now, you do get line-bred lurchers 
which almost come out like peas in a pod. So you can get like, I'm looking at some pups now, 14 generation Collie Greyhounds. They're all gonna come out to a certain confirmation, but they haven't got the drive or the working ability I want. So you can get peas in a pod. It will never be recognised by a pedigree because you've got, I don't know, to be registered as a pedigree. Well, no, but if, if you're tending down that line, you're, you're, you're heading towards pedigree with those but particular you, dogs. But you're only talking about one or two individuals in a sea of thousands. Okay. Well, I mean, I'd say with the world of cockers, which is you know, where, where, where I, I, I like to be, yes, okay, we all have our, our peccadilloes. I, I'm a cocker man. But the, uh, the thing about the cocker, which, as, it, as it seems to me, is that it was heading for the rocks in the yeah. 1980s. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, uh, some talented and, and quite wide-ranging Welsh breeders got hold of it, and goodness knows what went into the cocker. But when it came out the other side, it was an extremely vigorous, successful dog. Well, I think the cocker, dog. if you talk about Keith Erlinson, I think there was a lot of collie going there as well. <laughs> and the, um, you're, you're only insulting him because he's no longer with us. And, 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 <laughs> and, and the, uh, but they, they saved the breed. And cocker spaniels... Uh, I've got a lot of friends who got a lot of cockers, and I used to run a shoot and, w and, and work alongside. And I used to have springers myself, um, so I know the breed quite well. And but the cocker, like the Labrador, physically, the difference between a lot of cocker lines is like chalk and cheese. We've got cockers on shoots the size of Dachshunds to the size of Springer Spaniels. We've got Labradors that look like whippets and that look like tugboats. And you've got Springer Spaniels that are neither this nor neither that. So, it, you know, f this is why we're getting back to the point of what we've got is even in pedigrees, you've got a great differential of characteristics and physical sizes. Yeah, well, I've, I've got a piece of paper in the kennel club. You don't have that. I don't need it because I know <laughs> what this dog's worth. Oh, fair idea. There's sort of inverted snobbery going on here. I don't think I can cope with uh, no, the, co the cocker was definitely saved. I mean, we even had Her Majesty the Queen was, I mean the, was accused the of having a sprocker the other day. The cocker, uh, cocker, great rabbit and dog. And that's why it saved, it wasn't it? Rabbit shooting. Rabbit shooting saved. So again, rabbits, our world, got a lot to answer for. But it's, it saved the cocker spaniel because it was seen as the rabbit shooter's dog. Whereas nowadays, a lot of people see the cocker spaniel for what it is. It's a m fantastic little grafter. Sometimes the cockers I've seen work haven't got the stamina that they really need, but I think that's down to the people not keeping a lot of gun dogs as fit as what maybe Lurcher people would keep theirs and Terry people would, because a lot of people who, who I know and, and from the world of shooting that I know don't really look at the fitness of their dog and the feeding of their dog in the same vein that we have to because we're running athletes. Um, and you, you want endurance, you want stamina, you know, and you know what it's like with humans, if you're physically fit, you're mentally fit, if you're mentally fit, you're on pinpoint strong, and, and I think with a lot of gun dogs, they do get tired a lot quicker than what they should do, and it's not the dog's fault, and some, some Cocker Spaniels I see can now do Springer Spaniels and, and stamina, but a lot of them do fizz, and, and, you know, so there is differences. It, there are. Okay, just on, on feeding regime, I mean, when you're working this dog in season, what, what's it eating? At the minute, it is eating some Red Mills Racer because uh, I wanted to put a lot of pro protein in. I'm thinking about going back to feeding raw. Now, a lot That's of me... Isn't that a bit faddish? I thought you were anti-fad. Well, the thing is, the, um, when I fed a few years ago my dog's raw uh, and I got some lovely vitamin supplements from Door West Herbs, I didn't have to faff about with doing all the veg because it was one third meat, two thirds veg. And I found the dogs, and again, everybody that's got all the scientific facts will, will blow me out of the water. But for me personally, the dogs looked better, they worked better, and they were just mentally stronger. Uh, the problem is with feeding them biscuit, yes, it's convenient, because I'm always on the road, so I can't take raw meat with me. And the, uh, you always get that little level row of fat on the dog caused by biscuit and being a bit snobbish when 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 the dogs were fed on raw they looked like athletes and when you were taking pictures and you were working with them they looked they looked absolutely supreme they're, and, they're and up, aren't they? they looked as good as they worked whereas even on biscuit you can have the fittest dog in the world you've still always got that little fraction to take, you know, it's just a personal thing. And it's not just in the eye of the beholder. I mean, I, th I think that is accepted that, you know, raw, you raw know, does... And I think a lot of gun dog owners are now feeding raw and, and, and supplementing them. And even with Biscuit, they're supplementing them because, as I said, we, we've looked into our physical fitness a lot more and we are with the dogs because at the end of the day, you imagine 
how how much effort they put into their body, the pound in them joints get, the amount of work they do, and in what dangerous surroundings. You know, they've got to be physically fit. And I think a lot of people from whatever world, uh, for budgets, will feed to meet their their expectations of a budget rather than what is dietary right for their dog. I think that's the way to get around it. Now, the way to get Simon Whitehead onto a stage, if, if, if you ever need to, is ask him if he's got a book out. Um, and uh Well, funnily you should say <laughs> that, because last year we were on here, I've I written a cookbook. Well, if you read the programme, you wouldn't think I've I written a cookbook, but it was my book uh, called Ahead of the Game. Um, next year, I'm releasing Ahead of the Game, The Catcher and the Real Game Heroes. Um, I'm rewriting it and doing better recipes and, and better butchery, and it'll be released at the Game Fair in Ragley Hall next year. So next year, we'll be talking rabbits on the table again. Now, wait, is, it, is it just a cookery book, or is it more than a cookery no, book? No, it, it, it's going to be more than that. The last one was about the history, the preparation, the butchery, and the cooking. Um, and when I delved into the, the history of rabbit and how it's threaded into our social history, very interesting. And now I've been on a bit of the Keep Fit campaign and, and, and trying to live better and, and live longer. The, uh, I've been looking into to the dietary needs a bit more. And when you look at what rabbit does for your enzymes and your body and, and your cholesterol levels and your protein levels, there's a lot more there to be tapped into for the game market. And because a lot of people still today do not represent rabbits like they represent all the birds or venison. Okay, well you need to persuade me a little bit because uh, I, had a, I had a bit of a moment with rabbit. Shortly after I left school I, I found a good line in catching rabbits and selling them to local schools and we did so well with that, my buddy and I, that uh, w we found that you could sell them to the local kind of cadet corps at the school. They'd learn to skin the rabbit, then you could take the rabbit back for free and resell it to the kitchen. Uh, but then suddenly our, our, our methods were discovered and our contracts were cancelled and we had an awful lot of rabbit to eat over about two or three weeks and I've slightly gone off rabbit. Can, can you give me some way to re restart my love well, of rabbit? Well, rabbit's very versatile, so you've got a recipe for every different taste. Me personally, don't do bones, so it's going to be a simple, easy recipe. Saddles, best part of the, of the rabbit because it doesn't do no real work, it's just pure protein. Pan fry it, few minutes, stick it in a wrap, plenty of veg, few spices, bang, healthy, good for you, very quick and easy. And when I do my cooking demos, which I've, I've been dragged, kicking and spicking doing now, the, we do bunny burgers, and I'm yet to see anybody that refuses to eat rabbit in the form of a burger, which is now socially acceptable for any form of meat. So, like anything else, like any meat, venison, uh, partridge, pheasant, grouse, cook badly, you'll turn your nose up. Cook well, you'll love it. And it's the same with rabbit. It's just that everybody, when it comes to rabbits, their glass is half empty. Well, my job is to make sure everybody's glass is half full. Simon Whitehead, thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, Simon Whitehead.